Thank God for Kickstarter. Say what you will about how nobody's have sullied this name by asking people to pay them to do worthless crap like making a bowl of potato salad or mac and cheese, but at the moment, it's the one sanctuary disenfranchised gamers can turn to to get their fix of the kinds of games they enjoyed once upon a time. Oh sure, the indie scene has blown up and we're getting great new games for the truckload now, but that's basically because we, the fans of games like Mega Man or Banjo-Kazooie or Metroidvania style games, have essentially had to pick up the slack for the AAA giants who simply can't be bothered with niche games like these anymore. Some people starting their own smaller companies to get the job done, and some building a game from the ground up almost single-handedly. Contrary to what many would tell you, Freedom Planet doesn't play quite like a Sonic game, but it's just as memorable as a classics in my opinion, because it recaptures that unbridled passion they had, that constant need to impress the player at every turn with exciting set pieces and massive worlds, that love for simply being a game that products like Sonic Boom just don't seem to have. Similarly, Axiom Verge emulates Super Metroid like there's just no tomorrow. But it's not just the retro graphics or the huge world that draws people in, but it's also the mystery of that world that never ceases to feel strange and surreal and rather unfamiliar for this sort of game. It is a treasure trove of fresh creative new weapons and gear that feels sort of like something you might find in a new Metroid game, and not just something reused from one of the old ones. This is what people love about these games. They remind us of the old, but still somehow feel new. They give us what we want. It's not the superficial details that reel us in, we just want to be able to put that old factory muscle memory to use and it was still technically new game. So yeah, even without the big publishers and game devs giving us what we want, at least there will still be those in the gaming community who can do the job for them because hey, somebody has to. Still, I can't help feeling it becomes that much sweeter when we get things like My Number 9, Ukulele, and Bloodstained Ritual of the Night. I'm not going to say much about My Number 9 here because I do plan to review it or LP it upon its release, which is only a few months away, but I like the mechanics, I like the enemy and boss designs, the art design, level design, all that stuff. I do wish the world was a tad more bright and colorful, but still, it's a solid looking game that looks to be as good as any Mega Man game. Keiji Inafune, the driving force behind many of the later games and the creative mind behind many of his characters, knows what we want and is giving it to us himself after having formed his own company. While Capcom holds Mega Man at gunpoint to squeeze more merchandise out of him, all the while refusing to make any more games, Keiji has stepped in to basically give us the same thing. It's right in line with projects like Freedom Plant or Axiom Verge, only this time we have the original creative talent behind the real thing proving a point to the people he once answered to. While he seems to be on friendly terms with Capcom, there's still that corporate mire he has to wade through for our sake, to give us what we love. Many other people who also did work on several past Mega Man games are also on board because, again, if that big brand name in big yellow letters isn't going to do this, someone has to. It may as well be the original talent behind those games. Ukulele is a similar return to form for many X-Rare developers. For years, these people were mercilessly crushed under Microsoft's boot, forced to make nothing but shovelware that Microsoft told us we wanted. This is basically just a way for them to give those hacks a nice big old middle finger for restraining them all these years, finally free to put their talents to good use, as if not a day has gone by. Ukulele looks pretty fun. The character design is going to take some getting used to, and the world could use some fleshing out, it's basically a tech demo now, but it looks to be as big and colorful and lived in as any good old rare game of past generations. Then there's the most recent example that prompted me to make this video. Rule of three, you know. Bloodstained Ritual of the Night. Man, what is with these great title names? At the time of this recording, still barely a day since its announcement, this game has been funded three times over. Wow. This game is going to be such a treat. There are so many things I love about it, even aside from the gothic horror visuals, creature design, and other such elements you'd expect in a game like this anyway. I love the whole stained glass motif shared throughout the character designs, their weapons, and just everything. I'm pretty sure to get a kick out of the weapon crafting elements as long as they aren't overcomplicated or unintuitive. I like the idea of the story, this castle being created by the game's antagonist to be a sanctuary for the main lead, corrupted and filled with demons as a man continues to slink further into madness, overcome by the same curse that afflicts the main lead herself. I adore Miriam. Everything about her, her design, her clothes, the aforementioned stained glass motif that seems to be ingrained in her skin, the way she carries herself, the way she smiles. I especially like the bit of insight into her actual character they give us. Orphan? Check. Amnesia? Check. Okay, okay. Despite these cliches, she's described as being compassionate and protective of whatever friend she's able to make, and I find that so refreshing and pretty darn important, since characters in her place, with the kind of baggage she has, are usually detached and aloof, at least for most of their story, coming off as cold and unrelatable. Yet she seems to be friendly right out of the gate in spite of everything. She's sweet, and I look forward to seeing how her adventure plays out. Everything about this game just works for me, and we haven't even seen any actual gameplay footage yet. But everything we know about it so far is just so darn interesting. From the characters, to the explanation behind the castle, to the whole feel of it, this is going to be a beautiful game made by talented, focused people who have a clear vision and aren't going to let anyone get in their way. 
You see, my biggest problem with these old world publishers that have grown too big for their own good is that they seem to have this weird idea that they can just tell us what we want, tell us what to like, and we'll just go along with it like good little consumers because they're special, creating a self-fulfilling prophecy that they can only dream of. Then they give a shit about things like appealing to a broader audience, a wider market. Blech, such foul language. How dare they say such dirty, heartful things to us. Unfortunately, when you make a game with a bloated budget rivaling that of the Avengers, yeah, your actual fans probably aren't going to be enough to break even. You gotta find a way to make everyone buy your oh-so-special game so you can later come out and say your game was still a failure after selling a bajillion kajillion copies. That's what Keiji and Koji understand that they don't, is that you can make a smaller game just for your fans and turn a profit. And together we've had to make it clear again and again to these giants that we are still here, that we do still buy games, and that we are worth a damn. It's true, you can't really turn to Capcom or Konami or whoever anymore to get these games. Because the people who brought us those games back in the day don't work there anymore. It's just a brand name, Solus, with no desire to make you happy. This is a logo. It is a word. It is not your friend. It is not your buddy. It doesn't care about you, and you have no reason to remain loyal to it. Least of all memories of all the good times. And yeah, it's a business, duh, but these businesses are made up of people who get personally invested in whatever they're working on, and to be quite frank, the people currently behind the veil of these brand names simply don't get it. They don't understand why we still like these games that they don't feel like making anymore. In a way, it's like they don't want us to. For them, the world would be a much simpler, more sensible place if we could just give up on the games we want to play and shell out whatever spare change we have on the next Call of Duty or other similar intellectual properties they shut out like good little whales. They insist on reminding us time and again that we don't want these kinds of games, that even if we made them, you wouldn't buy them, or that there are so few of us that such a product couldn't possibly turn a profit now. That's what's so great about something like Ukulele or Bloodstain. The people who actually worked on those good old games they're based on, that provide us so much joy once upon a time, are at heart gamers themselves. They know what we want because it's what they want. They want to continue creating great art in the form of video games because they know we'll buy it because we've proven that time and again on places like Kickstarter. Sometimes fighting these games within hours of their announcement. Isn't that crazy? Doesn't that just show how people have been aching for that sort of game all this time? Of course, a big part of this success is made possible because these games are relatively much cheaper to make than all the kinds that AAA publishers want us to want from them. You don't need a budget on probably that of a blockbuster movie. Your game doesn't need to try to be a blockbuster movie. And you certainly don't need everyone to like your game. You just gotta find the market that does want your product and focus on them. Because as long as you don't go overboard and shit the bed, that will be enough to get by. And who better to take the helm than the granddaddies of these genres, the men who know they can do it bigger and better than anyone else? This is the kind of success story that makes me smile. I have more faith in the future of gaming now than I have in years, because even without the OK Go of these dinosaurs, these corporate giants, their shareholders, all that junk, there will always be games. We don't really need them anymore. Even if the entire market crashed overnight, guys like these and all the indie devs out there would pick up the reins and keep making new games for us. And you know what? Even if it was just the indie devs, that would be fine. But the fact that there exists a platform for works of art like these to get funded now, the fact that we've created this close relationship between these talents and us, these old developers, the fans, depending on each other without the need for those soulless brand names controlling everything, just shows how important and enduring games are. It's not just the games themselves that need to evolve, it's the world around them, which does seem to be happening whether the dinosaurs can keep up with us or not. There will always be a place for games like these. There will always be a market for things like Ukulele or Minor Nine or Bloodstained, and I look forward to hearing more success stories like them in the future. Maybe someday Kojima will be able to make a new horror game right in the vein of the Cancel Silent Hills, something that's basically the same game we wanted, only not attached to Konami in any way. Maybe he'll start a Kickstarter too, right after he's done playing with his dolls. Yeah. Toodles.